Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. He's a professor from Cornell, in, uh, where you study uh, in computer science, where he studies machine learning. And he got his PhD in, C in CMU computer science in 1997, where he did a lot of stuff about multitask learning. So here's Rich. Thanks. So, so I want to thank John for organizing this visit. Uh, OK. Uh, so the title is you know, Empirical Comparison of Learning Methods, but that's just going to be part of the talk. This isn't the kind of work I usually do. So usually I'm working on some, some hard problem. I'm developing new algorithms or ways of using old algorithms to do well. I don't usually spend this much time doing empirical comparisons of other people's work. But we got into this sort of by accident, and it just kept getting more and more interesting. So we sort of kept, kept working on it. So in, in the middle, I'll actually be presenting the new algorithm that we've developed. But it'll take us at least half an hour to get there. So, so. OK, so, um, so this is joint work with some of my grad students. In fact. Most of this work, Alex Nicolescu and I have done together. And he could be giving this presentation just as easily as I am. Uh, and then Christy Busia and Art Munson have done just little pieces that I'll show you later on. Um, let me try this. Cool. So I would say it's a sort of sad state of affairs right now for supervised learning. Uh, a sad state of affairs in the sense that you know we've been successful by some measure. right? We, we now have dozens of machine learning algorithms. We, we've got more than we need, perhaps. Uh, and a lot of these are very good. And a lot of the good ones are very recent. So a lot of these have happened in the sort of mid-90s to, to more recent times. So we've got you know, things like uh, SVMs, Bayesian methods, random forests, Gaussian processes. We've got, we've got all these different things. And the truth is we have very little wisdom about when you should use one of these or the other, you know, which ones really work best, what one is good for, when the others are better, and all that sort of stuff. And that's kind of disheartening, right? And, and to make it even worse, a number of people now consider the supervised vector learning state of affairs to be sort of done and are now moving on to other things, even though we have this huge unsolved problem about which of these should you actually use when and for what purpose. Um, and so, so that's sort of disheartening that people are sort of abandoning the field almost before we, we can tell people which of these they should use. And then to kind of make things worse, you know, I list things like a decision tree up here. Uh, well, decision trees aren't just one algorithm. There's actually sort of a dozen serious flavors of decision trees. Um, so there's lots of different flavors of decision trees. Similarly, you know, when you say neural net, I mean, you might all think of a single fully connected feed forward neural net, sort of the vanilla kind of neural net that's in the first chapter of the textbook. But you know, in the hands of a master, neural nets are actually a rich class of algorithms. Um, so, so when we say neural nets, we don't mean one thing. And even SVMs now, right? there's lots of different ways of training SVMs, lots of di different kernels. So each of these things, or, or at least many of these things, are really whole families of algorithms in and of themselves. When I say k nearest neighbor, I'm not really talking about one algorithm. I'm talking about sort of 10 years of research. Uh, so and then it turns out that even if you pick the member of the family you're interested in, you're inevitably going to end up with some parameters that you have to optimize to get that thing to work well. And failure to optimize those parameters correctly means you really do get inferior performance out of what might be an excellent algorithm for your purpose. And just to give you an idea, like the simplest algorithm, k nearest neighbor, it turns out the value of k that's good for accuracy is often a low value, you know, 7 or 11. And the value that's good for squared error is often some intermediate value, like 25 or 31 or something like that. Yet the value that's good for AUC is often 500 on, this, on exactly the same problem. Okay, so, so you really do have to optimize all of these free parameters correctly, or you get very much inferior performance. OK, so now I, sorry I can't experiment with all of these things. So I'm just going to experiment with the 10 that I've got highlighted here. So logistic regression, a whole bunch of different k nearest neighbor <laughs> algorithms. This is a whole family of algorithms. Uh, a variety of decision trees. We've got about a dozen different kinds of decision trees, all the way from lowly ID3 to some Bayesian-inspired decision trees that you've probably never heard of. Uh, we're going to use all the kernels that are in SVM Lite, one of the popular uh, SVM packages. We are going to stick with very simple neural nets, just single hidden layer, fully connected neural nets, ranging in size from sort of 1, 2, 4, all the way up to 128 or 256. So, so in fact, we're, we're not exploring the space of neural nets very thoroughly. Um, <coughs> Naive Bayes, uh, we're going to do bag decision trees. All the kind of trees we train up here, we're going to try bagging all of them. 
Uh, we're going to do random forest. How many people know random forest? Okay, so maybe I'll briefly say what that is. How many people know bagging? Okay, so, so I might even mention what that is. Um, so we're going to do random forest. That's a, a new kit on the block. And then we'll do uh, boosted decision trees. Again, we'll boost all of those kinds of decision trees. And we'll do boosted stumps, decision trees that are just one level deep. Is it uh, appropriate to ask a question? Oh, sure, sure. No problem at all. Sure. Yeah. So there's no, you didn't mention genetic algorithm, genetic programming, swarm intelligence. Right, things. right. Are those classified in here somewhere that I just can't see, or are those just not even? They're not, sure? those are optimization procedures, which would typically be applied then to some other algorithm, uh, some other representation. So, so a GA isn't itself a supervised learning algorithm. It's when you apply a GA to learn the weights or the architecture of a neural net that it suddenly becomes a neural net training procedure. R right, so... So I think of genetic algorithms as being basically fancy stochastic optimization. And then you have to wrap that around some model class. Genetic programming, genetic programming right, right. So, so that's getting closer to this. And I haven't worked with genetic programming. So, so but the, yeah, yeah, it'd be fun if you guys are experts in that. It'd be fun to, to have you try our data sets and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, that, that'd be good. So, so you're right, I probably should have another line there. Yeah. Okay. So, and feel free to stop and ask questions. So I've got more than we can probably get done in an hour, and I'm happy to stop. There are multiple places I can stop as we go. Okay, so the kinds of questions that, you know, hopefully we can find answers for are things like, is one of these learning algorithms just dominant? You know, does it just outperform all the others, and that's what we should use? Maybe we won't get that lucky, and maybe it just turns out that for certain loss functions you should use this, and for a different loss function use something else. You know, maybe neural nets are great at squared R, regression kind of situ settings, and uh, maybe SVMs are the best thing for classification. That, that would be fine. We'd be happy with that kind of answer. Maybe if nothing dominates, maybe at least a bunch of the algorithms will just turn out to be so inferior, we don't really have to try them on our problem. And that would be good. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about loss, um, ways of measuring loss, different performance metrics. It's going to turn out that some of our algorithms on some problems are going to have great performance on some loss, like maybe great AUC. But they're going to have terrible squared error. They're going to predict very bad probabilities. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, right? How can you be sort of super smart on a data set and yet in other ways do things that are stupid? So it'll often turn out that there's a way of correcting that. And John is one of the experts in, in doing this. So we'll, we'll talk about some work like that. And then if I can, I'll talk about how the different losses relate to each other and which ones are more or less robust. But it all sort of comes down to the big question, you know, what algorithm should you use, when should you use it, and why should you use it? So, so those are the kinds of questions we're looking at. Um, the experiments I'm going to show you have all been done on these eight data sets. And I've intentionally picked uh, four samples from the UC Irvine repository um, so that other people can compare their results with ours. But I'm also worried that we're all, you know, as a community, overfitting to UCI. Uh, so I, I'm working on some real problems where I have genuine collaborators and, and where they're actually interested in the results that we get. So, so this is like the Stanford Linear Accelerator group. They have a particle physics problem and, uh, you know, one or two of these are medical problems, th things like that. So, so I try to do a mix of working on real problems and also, of course, testing on the tried and true methods, uh, tried and true problems we all work on. And it turns out uh, it's a pretty expensive set of experiments, so doing eight problems is hard. We're now up to 10 or 11 data sets. And I don't have all my numbers for these 10, 11 data sets. So I'm going to show you numbers for the eight data sets. But I've peeked at the results on the 10 and 11 data sets to make sure that what I'm showing you is, is representative of what we would get with the rest. So, so whether there are differences, I'll highlight them later on. We're intentionally keeping the training data kind of modest, sort of 5K. So we're not in the large sample limit here. We're not talking about learning from millions or billions of examples. Okay? Uh, and one of the reasons we're doing this is this is where differences in performance be between algorithms often show up. This is where overfitting becomes a serious concern. There's a real trade-off to be made between capacity and, um, you know, and, and overfitting. So that's one of the reasons we're here. Also, we can just get more data sets here. And we can afford to train some of these algorithms there. And we wouldn't be able to train some of the algorithms if we had you know, 100 million examples. So, th so those are all of our reasons for, for staying here. Also, on some of these data sets, it means that we can hold aside a fair amount of data for test sets. So we're going to use pretty large final test sets. I mean, large in a small sense, right? They're going to be 20K or more. Um, so, and I should caution you, all the results I'm going to show are really only applicable if the problems you're looking at are sort of drawn from the same distribution that we drew these problems from. So these are all sort of 
25 to 500 dimension problems. If you're working on a bags of words model you know, with 10,000 dimensions and you've got 100 million training cases, there's no reason to think that the kind of story I'm going to tell here applies there. So, so similarly, if you've only got 50 training cases you know, in whatever dimensions, there's, again, no reason to believe that this story would apply there. Don't, don't extrapolate too far away from, from where we're doing our experiments. Those lines, there's this beautiful paper called Burning the Little. Right. Uh, right. Where they, they, they went to the very small sizes and right. they graphed the, the overall. They showed that depending on the amount of training data and the number of features, and that the optimal training algorithm changed and changed in these weird ways. And right. feature selection, you, you haven't said anything about feature selection either. Right. No, good, good. So, um, yeah, my own experience is that you tend to get two kinds of crossings if you look at learning curves of algorithms. And one kind of crossing happens at the very small sample size. You, you know, what's good with 10 or 100 cases is often different from what's good at 5,000 cases. There's also another crossing that often occurs at the very large sample size, you know, up at 100,000, a million cases or, or more. And of course, all of this is relative to the dimensionality and complexity of the problem and stuff like that. But, but those are the sort of places where crossings tend to be. And we're intentionally, hopefully, at a place in the middle where there aren't too many crossings of that form happening here. Feature selection, that's a really good point. All the work we're doing so far is without any form of feature selection. So we're using all the features in the algorithm, in the data sets. And if the algorithms do natural feature selection, say like a decision tree, then they're allowed to do it. But we're not doing any feature selection. And guaranteed, if we did feature selection, we could push up the performance of most of these things. So we're about to embark on a new set of experiments where we do a simple form of wrapper feature selection um, before doing all this stuff. And then we're going to try everything with one carefully selected set of features to see if it's tr still true. Yeah. So part of the differences we may see in performance may be because of the algorithm's inherent ability <coughs> to select features and ignore irrelevant features. So that's good. I'm glad you asked that. OK, so personally, I don't tend to have a sort of one favorite optimization criterion. Uh, like a lot of you, I, I believe it's important to optimize to the correct metric when designing things. Um, doesn't always turn out to be that simple, but, but that's certainly my, my first order goal, is to optimize to the right metric. And then different metrics really are capturing different things. Um, so I'm going to look at nine different performance measures here, as opposed to, say, just comparing all these things on accuracy or, or all on squared error. So I've got them categorized into three groups. So there are three metrics that depend on comparing the prediction to a threshold. All that counts is you're above the threshold, you're below the threshold. That's it. Doesn't matter how far above or below. So that's things like accuracy. Uh, F score is uh, precision and recall, if you're familiar with information retrieval. Uh, it turns out that really just depends on a threshold. And then lift, how many people know lift? So, so lift is used a lot in marketing. If you're going to send a, a brochure, say, to 10% of your customer base, you'd like to send it to the 10% most likely to respond to your brochure. So you maybe do a predictive model of how much customers will respond to your brochure. Then you just send it to the 10% that look most likely to, to, to respond. And lift is sort of a measure of how much better you're doing than random prediction. Uh, when you send the brochure. So if, uh, if um, random prediction is that only 5% of your customers would respond to your brochure, and when you send the thing to 10%, it turns out that 15% uh, of the customers you send it to respond, then you're doing three times better than random prediction. So your lift would be three. Um, so that's, that's lift. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time defining each of these attributes, uh, I mean each of these performance measures. So if you have specific questions about any of them, just, just let me know either now or, or afterwards. All right, so that's the three threshold metrics. We've got three measures now that depend just on the relative ordering that the predicted values induce. Okay, so these are things like area under the RSC curve, uh, average precision. So this is a precision recall plot. You do the average precision across the plot. Uh, and then the precision recall break-even point, the place where precision equals recall on the PR plot. Um, so again, these don't depend at all on the magnitude or the scale in which you predict. They just depend on the ordering that you get from that prediction. And now we have three measures that really do try to look at the predictions as probability. So now the scale is very important. Um, so that's you know, old friends like squared error and uh, cross entropy. And then I'll, in a five or six slides, I'll define what I mean by this probability calibration. But calibration basically means when you say 0.2, do you really mean probability 0.2? OK, so we're going to look at a bunch of these measures throughout the talk. Um, there is a, sure. My, for the last time, I hope. Mm -hmm. So uh, go back to that slide. Sure, sure. So, so I do spam filtering, mm -hmm. and I really care about 
but I don't care at all about the center. I care about, you know, am I getting right. 99%? And right. you've got a bunch of things that concentrate on the center and a bunch of things that sum across everything. Right, right. And it's too bad that you don't have any that talk that focus on the extremes. Yeah, so it turns out lift tends to focus a little bit on the extreme because it depends on where you put the threshold. And often when you do a lift threshold, it's sort of at a 10% mark or a 5% or 20% mark. And I think I'm using lift uh, 0.25 here. Um, so some of these do depend on where you decide to put the threshold. But, but I agree, I'm not looking at anything that, say, is just looking at, say, the top 5% or something like that. Now, we could take some of these measures, like ROC area, and specialize them, right, to being just the AUC area of the top 5%, 1% or 10%. Oh, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so hopefully, you know, I mean, certainly we could run those experiments, um, but I don't know where to set that threshold sort of without knowing more about the problem. So, yeah, yeah. So that's definitely a limitation of what we're doing because, as I know you know, um, AUC at 0.95 and AUC across the entire curve can be very, very different things. Yeah, so. So we've got a problem with the measures in that, well, let's see, accuracy is optimized when your accuracy is 1. Um, squared error is optimized when your squared error is 0. Lift, the top of the scale, you don't, can't even define what your lift could be until you know the fraction of positives and negatives in the data set, so it's data set dependent. AUC, sort of baseline is 0.5, and you know, bad is 0, and good is 1. So they all have different scales. And to make it even worse, different problems sort of induce different scales in these things too. So you know, we might have a stock market prediction problem where 60% accuracy is phenomenally good. That would be great. And yet we might have a credit fraud problem where 99% accuracy is trivially easy to achieve. Just predict there's no fraud, and you'll get it. Um, so, so this is sort of tough. If we're going to average across multiple problems, you, you know, we want to put everything on sort of equal footing. So what we're going to do is create these normalized scores. And the normalized scores are going to go from 0 to 1. And uh, they can actually be less than 0 and greater than 1, but I won't talk too much about that. Think of 0 as being baseline performance. So that's like a 0.5 AUC uh, for uh, accuracy or for squared R. Suppose your data set has 20% uh, positives in it. Baseline performance is what you would get if you just predict probability 0.2 that every case is a positive. So, so baseline is really easy performance for pretty much everybody to get. You can do worse than that, but most algorithms won't. <laughs> there is one negative number in some tables somewhere. That's because <laughs> the algorithm did poorly. And then best performance is going to be set to 1. And uh, I mean, if we knew the Bayes optimal rate for each data set, uh, and for each performance metric, that's what we'd set the top bar at being the Bayes optimal rate. But of course, we don't know that. So what we're going to do is sort of cheat. I mean, we're, we've got these test sets. We're going to look at the test sets and sort of pick the thing that really is doing best. And we're going to set the bar up there at 1 for that thing. And most things won't achieve that. So, so but that's just our way of putting everything on a kind of equal scale where variances across these things now make sense. And, and where I can, you can look in this table of huge numbers I'm going to show you, and you know, one just always means good performance. So, so that's the only reason why we're doing this. It's a pretty big set of experiments. So we got 10 learning methods. We got lots of different members of the family and parameters to set. So, so right away, we're going to train you know, hundreds of models on each problem. We're going to do five-fold cross-validation. So we're going to train you know, 10,000 plus models per problem. Um, and then we're looking at 10 to 11 problems. So we're going to train sort of 100,000 or more models. And then we're looking at nine different performance measures here. So, so we're going to do you know, on the order of a million evaluations of these models. And I tell you that for two different reasons. One is you know, it's an expensive set of experiments to run. So I want you to sort of get a, get a sense of it. Plus, you know you never get it right the first time, right? So, <laughs> so, so we're probably on our fifth time now training all these models. Um, so, so that's one thing. The other thing is to realize that we're generating kind of a million numbers when we run these experiments. And the challenge then is like a data mining challenge to somehow summarize these million numbers and you know, make an intelligible story out of them. So I'm, I'm going to try to do that. Um, but there's actually, I'm sure, lots of interesting information in all these numbers that I have not been able to, to glean from the data. So, so if anybody's interested in having a bunch of, of models, we'd be happy to. Other people have borrowed these models to do other things, like model selection experiments and stuff like that. We'd be happy to lend these models to you. You'll, you'll know better after I talk a little more what the models are. OK, so 
I'm going to start off just looking at probabilities. And we're going to spend probably the next 20 minutes just doing probabilities. Um, so in a couple of reasons. Well, one, I don't want to hit you with big tables with performance measures on you know, all these non-performance measures. So, so I just want to start in a simpler place. Plus, if you can predict the right conditional probability, I mean, you're essentially done on a problem, right? I mean, that's a sufficient condition to have solved a problem. And any reasonable performance measure would be optimized if you got the probabilities right. So, so, uh, so, so that's another reason. And then it turns out the story for probabilities is just an interesting story in and of itself. Um, and one of my students, uh, he won a best student paper award for just the part of the story that has to do with probability. So, so it's kind of a fun story all by itself. So, all right, so here's the first table of numbers. So let me walk you through this table. We're going to see a lot more tables like this. It's going to turn out you don't have to see all the numbers. So let me, let me really walk you through this. Um, I've got 10 different models down the side here. This is neural nets, bag trees, random forests, k nearest neighbor, logistic regression, vanilla decision trees, that's a single decision tree, boosted decision trees, support vector machines that have been scaled to 0 and 1 because these are probabilities a certain way. That's very bad. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that. Boosted stumps, single level decision trees, and naive bays. OK, so those are our 10 learning methods. And realize we train lots of different neural nets. We have lots of kinds of decision trees that we're bagging. K nearest neighbor is really a whole family of algorithms that, that we're, we're looking at. Um, SVMs, we're trying all bunches of kernels and things like this, all different ways of regularizing it. So, so what we do is every one of these entries is the average of the performance on eight problems okay, of these normalized scores. So again, one is good and zero is poor. Um, so this number is the average performance of eight different neural nets, one trained on each of the eight problems. And you know, on problem one, it could be a neural net with two hidden units was best. And on problem two, it could be 128 hidden units was best with a different learning rate and a different momentum. So don't think of this as being that there exists a single neural net that does this well on all of the problems. It just means if you went home tonight and restricted yourself to the family neural nets and did a pretty good job optimizing separately for each problem, this is the performance you would get on test sets after you had done that optimization. Similarly, uh, for SVMs, we have different kernels here. Uh, okay, there might be a linear kernel on one problem, an RBF kernel on a bunch of problems, th things like that, and different trade-offs uh, of margin for error and things like that. Okay, so each of these is the average of eight numbers. Uh, this mean column is the average across the three measures. So the measures are squared error, cross entropy, and calibration, and this is the mean of those three things. And if something is bold, that means it was statistically indistinguishable from the best models that we saw for that particular model, uh, for that particular problem. So, for example, the best performance we got on squared error on average across the eight problems is random forest, 0.882. The next best thing is bag decision trees, and the third best is neural nets. And these are all statistically indistinguishable from that performance. But the next one down, 783, that is distinguishable from those. That's quite a big drop. Um, similarly, for cross entropy, bag decision trees just sort of outperform random forest by a very tiny amount. It's not statistically meaningful. And then neural nets come in third again. But neural nets are really good in this calibration measure that I'll tell you about soon. And in fact, these don't do nearly as well. So when you average these things, it turns out the neural nets are sort of in first place. And their mean performance is distinguishable from the performance of these other things. So, so that's kind of a surprising thing all by itself is that you know, here's some of our favorite new algorithms, right? We've got SVM sitting down here and boosted decision trees and random forests. And, and these things are not performing as well. That, that story is going to change. That, that picture is going to change very quickly. So don't feel disheartened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I, I just give me that I don't think you've mentioned yet, though, the, uh -huh. the cost in the calculation here, the cost of running the algorithm. Uh, no, right, right. And I haven't mentioned that at all. Yeah, so, so it's interesting stuff. And we're starting to look at that a little more methodically. The neural nets are kind of expensive. Turns out the bag trees are pretty cheap because it's just so easy to parallelize and you don't have to train too many of them. The random forests are kind of expensive because it's a serial process unlike, uh, I'm sorry, it's not a serial process, but you have to generate thousands of these, whereas bagging you typically get away with 100. Uh, K nearest neighbors, it's so dependent on the training set sample size that it's hard to generalize that. But uh, K nearest neighbor is reasonably affordable. Um, boosted trees are kind of expensive because that's a serial process. You really sort of have to train them in a row, and you have to train thousands of them. The SVMs are actually one of the more expensive things. Uh, and the reason most SVMs came back very, very fast, but for extreme settings of the trade-off of uh, margin and error, 
sometimes the SVMs, as far as we can tell, never terminate, or at least, you know, they don't terminate in our CPU's lifetime. Uh, and this was with SVM light, right? And, and Torsten is fixing some of these things uh, as we speak. Um, so, 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 so <laughs> some of the SVMs, it, it turns out, were very expensive, even though most of them are, are very fast. So, and it depends on our implementation. Like we're using, we're using the Weka implementation for random forests, and that's not a particularly uh, efficient implementation of random forests. Uh, but we're using better implementations for bag decision trees and boosting, which we wrote ourselves. So, so it's kind of hard. It's not a really fair comparison of computational performance on any of these. But, and then some things we've got to be careful. Like we're, we're training lots of neural nets and trying lots of different kinds of trees whenever we're doing a tree method and lots of different kinds of K nearest neighbor. Um, you know, logistic regression is just one simple family with one tunable smoothing parameter. And naive Bayes, we're just training one model there. So, so this, is a, this is a very simple class. There's just one thing in it, and you train it, it's fast, and it's done. Uh, so that also gives these sort of a disadvantage, right? We don't, we don't have 100 different parameter settings here to optimize over. So it means that we're not picking the best of a large class, where some of these others could benefit from the fact that we're picking the best from a large class of functions. So, so that's a concern. So, sure. There seems like there's a presupposition here that there is there is a single best method that's best for all purposes. Or Th that'll disappear, but it's certainly where we started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, hold that thought, and uh, we'll come back to that. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So the neural nets are doing pretty well. Bag trees and random forests are doing very well, uh, and some of our favorite algorithms aren't doing very well. And I'll talk about why these aren't doing very well. Um, bag trees, everybody knows this, right? You take, a, okay, you take a bootstrap sample of your training set, train a tree, keep the tree. Take another bootstrap sample of the training set, train a tree, keep the tree. Repeat this maybe 100 times. And now you just take the average of the predictions that come from those 100 trees for every test case. It's incredibly simple. It works amazingly well. And it is perhaps the most underrated algorithm on the planet. So, so th this is a really, a really good method. It just, the nicest thing is it's robust. It just rarely fails because trees can handle missing values. This thing can handle missing values. It's just such a nice algorithm. It runs in minutes, can handle pretty large sample sizes, can handle any kind of attribute. Boy, this is just a nice algorithm. If you give me a new problem, my first way of looking at the new problem is often to train a bag tree on it just to get a flavor of what's possible. And then I might move on to something more specialized. But this is often where I start, because I can just get answers in minutes. And I know nothing else is going to do 10 times better than that. It's only going to do epsilon better. There's a the question was, why did you try to track on the decision? That, that's, a, that's a good question. And we already know on some of these problems that things like bagging neural nets would perform much, much better. Make the neural, bag neural nets would be higher perform and, performers than bag decision trees. And the only reason we've done it has been a computational cost issue. So it's just kind of expensive to have to train 100 decision trees of each, I'm sorry, 100 neural nets of each size on each of these problems. Um, and so we're also good, we're just going to boost decision trees and stumps for exactly the same reason, just because we can't afford to do this meta learning on top of some of these other algorithms. 10 years from now, we would run the experiment very differently because we'd be able to, to do that. Yeah. So, uh, decision trees by themselves didn't perform that well. I mean, no, no. In fact, decision trees, the funny thing about decision trees is that they're a beautiful marriage for a lot of these meta learning procedures because they're individually fast. It turns out they're individually low bias. And they are steerable in the way, for example, that boosting wants to be able to steer them. So they're very nice that way. If you could boost or bag neural nets, if you can afford to do it, that, that'll probably do even better. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think that's a that's a really good question. So I'm glad you asked that. So, so, so sure. most of things you are talking about is based on binary classification. Oh, and it's all binary classification. So what sense do you have as to whether the conclusion you are you have you are going to reach can be generalized to multiple classes or maybe even regression problem? Yeah. No. None. You don't None. you don't want to say that. So I mean I have I have personal experience which will be consistent with much of the story that I would tell here, but but no, even to the multi-class problem, which you might think of then as a bunch of binary classification problems, um, it doesn't guarantee that good performance on binary classification would yield better performance on multi-class. Yeah. So so and all of the metrics, most of the metrics we're looking at are designed for binary classification. Yeah. So. Okay. So that's uh, bag decision trees. Uh, random forests are sort of like bag trees, but even dumber. And of course, the genius of Leo Breiman is that means they work even better. So we do a bootstrap sample of the data. 
Now we go to train a tree and we do a random sample from the available attributes. Maybe we pick 10 of the 100 available attributes to decide what test to install at the root. We do that test. We pick the one that's best of the 10 we're allowed to look at. Now we have to install another test. We just draw another random sample of the available attributes to decide which test to put here. And then from that sample, we put in what's best. And then when we have to install this test, we do a different random sample, put in whatever everyone's best. And what this does is it creates a, a much more high variance set of trees than bagging does. Because bagging, if you do a bootstrap sample from the training set, it turns out you still have a sample that looks kind of like the original sample, especially if your training set was large. So you don't get that much variance. You know, Often the root test and the other tests high in the tree are virtually the same for every bootstrap sample. Bagging, I'm mean, sorry, uh, random forest really changes that. Random forest really modifies the trees quite a bit. They don't look that, that much the same. And yet it does it in a magic way which allows the trees to still have pretty good performance. And that's critical because random forest, we're going to train now thousands of trees this way. It turns out there's so high variance, you have to go to thousands of trees. Um, we're just going to use simple unweighted averaging, just like in bagging, of all of these trees. So that means we don't get to uh, give less um, weight to trees that have poor performance. So if many of these trees have poor performance, you're, you're going to suffer. So the cool thing about this way of selecting randomly from the attributes is you still get pretty high performing trees. So and if you're interested in that, we can talk about that later. So um, anyway, so, so this is random forest. And uh, Leo Bryman claimed that it performed you know, pretty much as well as boosted decision trees in his experiments. And, and it is going to be pretty close in most of our experiments as well. Um, OK, so that's a random forest. And boosting, everybody knows boosting? So random forest, by the way, random forest really is an algorithm tied to trees. If, if you go to do random forests of neural nets, I don't know what that means. You might be able to come up with something, but, but I don't know what that means. Whereas bagging and boosting, you can apply that to neural nets, no problem. So, so. OK. So let me tell you what I mean by this calibration measure. Um, so suppose uh, 100 days this year, the weather forecaster has says there's a 0.7%, you know, a 70% chance of rain. And that's, yeah, so, so this is good for Seattle. So, um, so suppose at the end of the year, you now count. And on, in fact, 70 out of 100 of those days, it rained. That's good, right? That means when they said 70% chance of rain, they were really right on the money. OK, so that means they're well calibrated at 0.7. Now, you can be well calibrated at 0.7 and still be poorly calibrated at 0.2. The fact that you're right in part of the space doesn't mean you're right everywhere. So there's a thing known as a reliability diagram. And what we do is, let's take all the predictions your model makes okay, between 0.7 and 0.8. So, so a bunch of test points that your model predicts are between 0.7 and 0.8. And we're going to compare the mean prediction to the actual observed rate in that bin. Okay, so maybe there's 100 points in here. Let's say the mean prediction is kind of 0.75, which it might be. And let's say the observed rate is about 75% of those 100 things. And that would be good calibration in that bin. And if we get sort of comparable uh, mean rates and observed rates in each of these bins, then we're well calibrated everywhere. So what you typically do is you, you plot on this axis, say, the mean predicted rate in each bin. And you plot on this axis the actual observed fraction of positives uh, in a test set. And if your model follows the diagonal, then it's well calibrated. OK, so that's a. So what was the baseline for this? Because you always choose to marginally get 100%. Right. It makes calibration a surprisingly nasty measure to optimize to. And in fact, you never, right. OK, so l let me explain that to everybody else. So suppose your data set is 50% positives and negatives. You predict 0.5 for everybody. Baseline now has perfect calibration. Everybody will fall in the one bin. Okay, and the observed rate will exactly equal the predicted rate because I've just defined that's what baseline is. So you'll end up with perfect calibration for a model that's not very smart. Right? So that's a problem with a calibration measure in that you can get great calibration from like k nearest neighbor with k set equal to the size of the data set because then it always <laughs> predicts baseline. Right? So, so this is a measure you should never optimize to individually. Okay, it turns out if you've optimized your measure to something else, AUC, accuracy, squared, or s something like that, then it makes sense to go and look at the reliability diagram you get to see if it's well calibrated. But you wouldn't want to optimize directly to just this. We're going to use just one number, which is the uh, mean absolute deviation from the diagonal line. And that number will be optimized for the baseline model. And, and so you don't want to do that. You would think 
uh, that there are good ways to solve this problem so that we have a better calibration measure. And despite talking with a number of people who are experts in this area, we can't come up with one that's better than squared error or log loss. So, so it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm glad you, you mentioned that, because it's a real problem with this measure. But I'm curious, what did you use? I mean, if baseline is perfect. Uh, oh, oh, right, 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 zero, right. Zero, right. So, so how did we set our, our bottom threshold yeah. and our upper threshold? Yeah. So I think we sorted down through the models that we saw, and we oh, went a certain percentage down. We didn't take the really worst, worst one, but we went a certain percentage of the way down. So we looked at other measures, found out what percentage of the models tended to fall at baseline or below. And then we sort of went down that same percentage uh, to, to, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So it really is a problem, right? We don't even, these normalized scores I've been telling you about, we have a well-defined, I think, acceptable procedure for setting the top and bottom of the scale for the other eight measures. But for baseline, we have a real problem. So, so we had to fudge something. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so this is not a bad reliability diagram. Notice we're a little systematically high here, then we cross, and then we're a little systematically low there. Right? So this is reasonable performance, though not great performance. Um, and high here means that we'd like to take the predicted values and sort of move them over you know, towards the diagonal, which means we'd like to predict higher probabilities for these cases and predict lower probabilities for those cases. So, OK. This is what reliability diagrams look like for SVMs. OK, so if you train an SVM on standard hinge loss, so you're really training for maximum margin on accuracy, uh, that's what the reliability diagrams will look like. Notice it's not at all following the diagonal line. But that's, but that's by design, in a sense. That's what an SVM is supposed to do. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So, and we're going to talk about ways of sort of fixing them while keeping this good, yeah, yeah. And, and John has done, done work on this that we'll, we'll talk about. So, so this is what comes out on, this is just six of our, of our 10 or 11 problems. And, you know, if you squint, you sort of see a sigmoid shape curve here. So now why did we get such poor performance out of SVMs? Well, we did that because we did a very stupid thing. We took the uh, distance from the hyperplane can be sort of you know, plus infinity or minus infinity, how far you are from the separating hyperplane. And we just took so the smallest value we saw on the test set and made that 0, and the largest value made that 1, and then just linearly scaled everything in between. Okay, and if you do that, you know, you'll see exactly this sort of curve on a 0 to 1 probability space. Although this is, this is really a dimensionless scale here, right? This is just sort of minus infinity out to the left and plus infinity to the right, and you'll get a graph like that. Okay, so that's something that needs to be corrected if you want to look at probability, squared R, log loss, uh, and calibration. Um, Platt scaling, so your, your very own John Platt. Uh, back in 99, uh, created a method for fixing this problem with SVMs trained the traditional way. Um, so what, what John did was he basically fits a sigmoid to these predictions and then uses the sigmoid to correct for that, that distortion in the probability predictions. Um, and there are some important things. You've got to fit the sigmoid on a validation set. You can't fit it on the training data, so you have to hold a science of data. And then to make that work well, you want to prevent overfitting, you do some form of cross-validation. I think you recommended threefold cross-validation in what you were doing. And then you use a sort of way of smoothing the targets that's, that's motivated by, by a Bayesian analysis of the, the problem. Um, but basically, the big picture is, so there's some detail to worry about, but the big picture is we fit a sigmoid, and then we do that, use that to undo the distortion that's caused by hinge loss. And if we do that, so here's SVMs that were scaled to 0, 1 the old way. Here's SVMs that are now transformed with Platt scaling. And essentially, this is a, a two-way tie for first place, right? Uh, I mean, SVMs are better than neural nets here. They're better than neural nets here, well, by incredibly slight amounts. Uh, they're slightly worse than neural nets here. The means are indistinguishable. I mean, don't look at small differences in performance here and see that as being meaningful. So, so essentially, now the neural nets are tied, I mean, the SVMs are tied for neural nets on predicting probabilities as long as you do something like plot scaling. So, so that's great. And now you've got to ask if, if we can do something that will correct the distorted probabilities that were coming out of SVMs, would some of these other algorithms also benefit from us doing that sort of correction? So, and the answer is going to be, be yes. So. I'm a little confused. I mean, I can definitely see why the plot scaling is going to improve the calibration score. Right. Why is it improving the squared error so much as well? Oh, so we'll think about it. Um, you've got a bunch of cases that are labeled 0 and 1, right? And suppose you have a bunch of cases uh, where, a, imagine you have a bunch of, this is the simplest situation, you've got a whole bunch of cases that are identical. 20% of them are zeros and 80% are 1s. 
that's in the uh, Exactly, uh, exactly. So you really should be predicting 0.8, but in fact the SVM wouldn't be predicting so 0.8. So squared error doesn't refer to a binary loss. This is actually, you're actually using the predicted value now to... Oh, thank, thank you, yes. So we're not taking the output that comes out of the model and then truncating it to zero, one. We're actually taking the probabilistic prediction from the model. Okay. Right, right. So to Breyer. Yeah. So you've mentioned log, log loss a right. couple times, but it's not one of your... Oh, I, I'm sorry. Cross entropy is what I mean by log loss. So I'm, I'm sorry. So, um, so when I say log loss and cross entropy, I mean, uh, I mean the same thing. Thanks. So... Okay, so this is cool, right? I mean, you know, somebody who we thought was a really good guy, you know, is now doing really, really well, uh, th thanks, thanks to John's work. Um, so now you've got to wonder, you know, there's a couple others down here that we kind of like, like boosted trees. Uh, it, you know, maybe the same sort of thing would help them. So, uh, so now I'm going to step back. Let's look at all of these performance measures. Okay, and sort of justify why we might think some of these others would benefit. So now we've got the three threshold measures, we've got the three ordering measures, and then these are the probability measures that we've been looking at. Okay, so these are the same numbers you've seen before. And now the mean is calculated across all nine measures, not just the three probability measures. Okay, and remember, on all of these things, you know, one is good and zero is not so good. And uh, they're all sorted just by this mean performance. So neural nets are still doing extremely well, right? This humble algorithm that you could have trained in, these are simple neural nets. You could have trained this thing in 88, probably. Um, it turns out that's still doing extremely well. Um, and uh, the SVMs, now that they've been plat scaled, are doing extremely well. I've gotten rid of the SVMs down here that were 0 to 1. That was always a bad thing to do. So, so we've excised it from the table. Uh, so now we're doing the right thing. And we're being careful. Um, we're really just plat scaling things, and we're doing probability calculations here. Um, plat scaling could have an effect on things like accuracy by making, you know, maybe the threshold shouldn't have been at zero on the original SVM. So and it could be after calibration now that the probability, now the, the separating threshold really should be 0.5. So, so it can affect this. But we're assuming that you could do things like find the best threshold since we have a validation set. So, so we're just not plat scaling uh, things on these measures. So we're plat scaling where necessary. Turns out if you do a monotonic transformation like a sigmoid, you'll have no effect on the ordering that's predicted. Predicted, you'd always be able to find a new threshold that would give you exactly the same value you got before. So we're kind of you know, not worrying about plat scaling over here, and we're just using it where it actually contributes over in these probability measures. Um, OK, so now let's see. So neural nets are doing very well. SVMs are still in second place, as long as you plat scale them when you want probabilities. Bag trees and random forests are doing very well. So that's great. This is a four-way tie for first place. These are not distinguishable statistically. So don't take the fact that this is in fourth place and really think that that means it's, it's doing much worse than neural nets, right? The, these sort of first, second, third place kind of things are always dangerous. You, you tend to read more into them than maybe, maybe we should. Um, something interesting, boosted trees. Bold, 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 bold. And in fact, it wins. It's the best performer on five out of six of those numbers and it's close second on the sixth number. Boosted trees are doing incredibly well on these measures, on the threshold measures and on the ordering measures. They're just generating terrible probabilistic predictions. They're very poorly calibrated, and that's why their mean performance is not so good. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, just to sort of reinforce, notice I've just labeled now in each cell, this is the eight data sets, adult cover, you know, that we're working on. Those are our eight data sets. I've put in each cell the method that happened to be the best performer on that. Be careful, you know, the second best performer might be second best by 0 .0001. So, so, so take this with a grain of salt. But notice there's lots of neural nets over here, you know, in these probability things. And there's some neural nets in other places. There's some there and there. Um, there's some bag trees, you know, all over the place. There's lots of boosted trees. Okay, but all the boosted trees are always over in this side of the table. Okay, there's not a single boosted tree over here, and that's because it's predicting bad probabilities. So, and in fact, if we summarize that table by just counting how many times different things win, neural nets win 17, uh, how many entries in that table? There's eight problems, nine measures, so there's what, 72 entries in the table. Neural nets win 17 of them. Uh, bag trees win 13 of them. Boosted decision trees win 19 of them. And what's amazing about that, winning 19, that's more than neural nets, is effectively they're only able to play in two-thirds of the table, whereas neural nets are, are playing all over the table. So right away that tells you that boosted trees are just performing incredibly well. 
And maybe if we could fix their probabilities, they'd be doing well there too. Uh -huh. If you back the boosted decision to assume that fix the, the problem, because now I think you get it yeah. right there because you have a hundred, right? I assume that you take the probability right. as how many of those guys voted for one. It's, a, it's an interesting question. So um, the way we're doing the probabilities in bagging and boosting is we're actually taking the probability that comes out of each tree and then averaging it. Except when we do boosting, we convert it to 0, 1, and then we do the fraction that are positive and negative. So you have probabilistic decision trees then? Uh, yes, we're using probabilistic decision trees. Yeah. All, all of our models, um, where possible, return a probability when we average those. So it'll turn out that, let's see, if we were to, for reasons which I won't go into, um, but they're related to John Langford's prob probing algorithm. If we were to boost bag trees, where the bag trees were converted to a 0, 1 loss before we did the boosting, then that wouldn't work so well. But if we were to bag boosted trees, <laughs> where the boosted output was converted to a 0, 1 loss, then that would work well. So it turns out bagging on the outside would be effective, but not on the inside. Yeah. Uh, the random forest. Oh, that's interesting. I, I'd love to talk yeah, to you about that. that. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to talk yeah. about that. That, that. That sounds great. And there's a way of combining probing, which is John Langford's algorithm, um, with random forest and bagging as well. So, so maybe we could really combine all these things into one super algorithm. Uh, I, I like that. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Um, OK, so the boosted trees are doing awfully well at everything except predicting probabilities. This is why they're not predicting good probabilities. So, Here's one step of boosting, four steps, eight, 32, 128,000 steps of boosting. Now, one step is just a single decision tree. Right? We haven't really done any boosting yet. Notice that this is just on one of the problems. And this is a histogram of the probabilities that come out of the tree. So notice there's some probabilities near 0, probabilities near 1, some in the middle, You know, the usual chunky thing you get coming out of a single tree. As we do some steps of boosting, notice that some of the probability mass is sort of moving to the middle. More is moving to the middle and starting to leave the edges. So it's leaving the tails near 0 and 1, and it's being pushed to the center. Okay, so, so as we do more stages of boosting, we have very few predicted probabilities near 0 and 1, and more is pushed towards the center into what is often this sort of bimodal uh, distribution. And look at the uh, reliability diagram for these different stages of boosting. This is, in fact, the reliability diagram you saw before. Okay, a little high here and a little low here. Now it's actually pretty flat. The model's not really smart yet, but it's actually a pretty good reliability diagram. Now it's actually low and then high, lower, higher, lower, higher, and even lower and higher. So we're seeing as we do boosting this characteristic sigmoid shape emerge. And in fact, that's to be expected. So, um, so boosting, is far, boosting is viewed now as a maximum margin method, just like SVMs. It's far more concerned about getting things right that are near the threshold near the decision boundary. And it's far less concerned about predicting accurate probabilities for things that are in the tails that are easy, far from the surface. So in fact, it's putting all of its attention in the middle of the space. And it doesn't care if it has to sort of hurt the predictions it makes from a probabilistic point of view for things that are in the tail here. So that makes a lot of sense. And this is consistent with lots of different interpretations of boosting. So I think we might be the first ones to sort of observe the phenomenon empirically. But it's certainly consistent with what everybody thinks. Uh, boosting as a maximum margin method, or the, the idea that it's doing additive logistic regression, or even Bryman had an interpretation of boosting as an equalizer, where it's trying to make essentially the same error rate on all cases. And if you're going to make the same error rate on all cases, the probabilities have to mush, push towards 0.5. So, so now we're going to apply plat scaling to the boosted tree. So I've just got seven of the problems up here. So this is problems P1 through P7. This is the histogram you get after, say, 1,000 stages of boosting. So that's a different problem, different problem. Notice how much probability mass is missing near 0 and 1 on all of these problems. These are the reliability diagrams you look like. They should look a lot like the SVM reliability diagrams. So we can use Platt's method to fit a sigmoid to these. And then after Platt scaling, look at how nice the histograms are. Now we have probability significant probability mass going near 0 and 1 on all of these problems, except for this uh, slack problem. And it turns out this is the right answer probably for the slack problem, because it turns out the particles are never completely distinguishable from each other, given the available features. So you probably shouldn't predict near 0 and 1 for them. But notice that a lot of probability mass has moved back towards 0 and 1, where you might imagine it should be. And now the reliability diagrams are much better. Okay, They're, they're much more diagonal. So Platt scaling has done for boosting exactly what it was doing for, for SVMs. Um, and now, if we go back to the probability numbers and we plat scale 
all of the models. We're just going to plat scale everything. And if it helps, we'll use those numbers. And if it hurts, we'll use the numbers from before it was plat scale. So what does it help? It helps boosted trees a lot. It helps SVMs, random forests, boosted stumps, vanilla decision trees, and naive bays. Those things are all, they all benefit from plat scaling. The things that it doesn't help or possibly even hurts are neural nets, bag trees, K nearest neighbor, and logistic regression. It, it actually does hurt neural nets. They're already so well calibrated that applying plat scaling just, just makes them a little worse. Look at this. Boosting has now moved into first place, and it's a commanding lead here. I mean, this is statistically distinguishable differences. Um, boosting is really doing quite well. It's now outperforming, on these test problems at least, the neural nets and the plat scaled SVMs. So suddenly it's doing very, very well. So, so that's kind of nice. And now if we go back to the full table and we sort by overall performance, I mean, boosting was already sort of dominating on the left here. Now it's dominating <laughs> on the probability measures, so it's just sort of dominating overall. So, so it's doing extremely well. Um, this is not a huge difference in performance. I don't want to overstate that difference. It's statistically distinguishable. Um, but, but you know, this is sort of a commanding lead. Look at how similar these algorithms are to each other, right? Especially those two. You know, that's essentially a tie for second place there. Notice that's random forests, by the way, now. Random forests have now moved up because plat scaling has helped them here. So they're actually outperforming neural nets by a little bit and SVMs by a little bit and the bag trees. OK, so now, there are different ways you could achieve this calibration. Plat scaling is just one approach. One thing we could do is, you know, hey, optimize to the right metric in the first place, stupid, right? I mean, maybe we should do that. So when we can do that. We can do boosting with log loss instead of boosting with exponential loss. So, so in that, there's a method for that proposed by uh, Collins and Singer um, four or five years ago. Uh, and they even say in their paper, they do a simple empirical test. They say more testing is needed before we'll really know if this is an effective procedure. Um, you can uh, train SVMs just to maximize the likelihood directly. Now, if you do that, you don't really get a sparse solution like you do typically with, with SVMs. Um, and at least, John, in your paper, it yielded comparable performance, right? Sometimes one was better, sometimes the other was better. Um, so so that's, that's good. Um, and if you optimize to the right metric, then you don't need to do any post calibration, which would be nice. But there are other ways. So you can train the model to some wrong criterion, you know, like hinge loss in the SVM or exponential loss in boosting, and then do some sort of correction afterwards. So that's, that's like plat scaling. There's also a completely analytic way for doing it that I'm not going to talk about. It doesn't perform very well in our hands. Yeah, yeah this is not very good, so, so I don't even bother to put it in the table. And then there's other methods of doing this sort of correction uh, besides plot scaling. There's a method called isotonic regression, which is a very general, powerful method. And uh, I think statisticians have known about this for 50 plus years. Uh, the people who get credit for bringing it into the machine learning community for calibration, I think, are Zadrozny and, and Elkin about four or five years ago. So and I'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, so let, let's say we boost with log loss instead of boosting with exponential loss. So then we don't have to do any post-calibration. Here's stumps. Yeah, that's a big improvement, but it doesn't make the boosted stumps. Uh, oh, uh, uh, let me say, this boosting to log loss there is, uh, let me be careful here. This is boosted stumps to log loss. Oh, I, I should have on here what boosted uh, stumps were when they were trained the traditional way. Sorry, sorry, I took that out of the table. This is stumps directly optimizing log loss, and this is stumps doing plat scaling. Notice that this is a significant improvement in performance by not optimizing to the right metric and then doing post-calibration correction. And we've seen this in general. It turns out optimizing to the right criterion does yield better performance, but nowhere near as good as we can get with, with plat scaling. And, and we think part of the reason for this is you're using an independent validation set when you're doing plat scaling. And you're really preventing overfitting in a way that you don't do. Boosting is an algorithm prone to overfitting in a way that you don't do if you optimize to log loss directly. So, so this is sort of interesting. We think a lot of the benefit comes from this held out validation set. Um, so same sort of thing if we look at the decision trees. If we boost the decision trees to log loss, it turns out they're, they're essentially the same as the stumps. And this is because once you're boosting full decision trees, it turns out often the data becomes separable. And once the data is separable and you're doing log loss, you're basically predicting zeros and ones again. And it just turns out that it overfits dramatically to any data set. Whereas you don't overfit if you do exponential loss and then do plat scaling afterwards. So and in fact, you know, this is giving the best performance we're seeing. 
So, so that's really quite a difference between those things. I mean, you might have hoped that optimizing to the right criterion was the right thing to do, but clearly we still need to do some work for boosting if that's what we want to do. Okay? And also with SVMs, it doesn't seem to work any better than, than this approach. Um, so isotonic regression, this other method I mentioned, uh, let me not talk too much about it just for the sake of time. But So what is a sigmoid? Right, It's a monotonically increasing function that's going to transform a certain kind of distortion out of the, the space. Um, this isotonic regression is going to have to be a monotonically increasing function. Um, and it can find any function. It doesn't have to be sigmoid shape. So the sigmoid is now just a special case of what isotonic regression can find. So this is more powerful. Um, and what's nice is there's a, a linear time algorithm for doing it. So it's actually easier to do isotonic regression than it is to do, to do your method. So this is a very nice, powerful technique. Um, and if we do it, so here's what we saw before. These are these uh, seven problems, what the histograms look like before. This is the fitted isotonic regression curve. And notice that what isotonic regression does is, suppose you have a bunch of zeros, and then you have a one, and then a zero, and now a bunch of ones. You're really doing the right thing for everybody, except for maybe this one and the zero that are out of place. And what isotonic regression will do is it'll say, well, I'm not allowed to move things past each other. That would be non-monotonic. So it's not allowed to do that. It says, I'm going to just create a plateau where I put these two guys and make a tie out of them. So it puts the zero and one in the middle that are, I'm sorry, the one and the zero in the middle, which are in the wrong order with respect to each other. And it says, I'm going to make a plateau. And in this case, there'll be a one on it and a zero on it. We'll give it a probability 0.5. So now we'll have all these things that are getting zeros, all these things that are getting ones, and there'll be this one little plateau in the middle that's getting 0.5. Well, isotonic regression does that everywhere in the space. And you see you get these stair steps. And that's where it's created plateaus, where it saw a large amount of inconsistency in the ordering, and it had to create a plateau large enough to create ties there. Um, so that's what isotonic regression does. Because of that, now, you know, if you squint, they look kind of like, you know, bumpy, I mean, plateaued sigmoids, right? Because the sigmoid was a pretty good transfer function to begin with. But this is a little more powerful and flexible. You can see that one's distinctly non-sigmoidal in shape. Okay. Um, so and this is what the histograms look like after isotonic regression. And you know, they're really chunky now because we've got bins, bins that we're creating in a histogram, and they're interacting in some funny way with the plateaus that are being created by isotonic regression. In fact, one way to think of isotonic regression is it's automatically creating bins in certain places to average these things. So anyway, we end up with a sort of chunky looking distribution of probabilities there. That's kind of ugly. That, that'll, there are ways to patch that up. And the reliability diagrams, though, are very nice. So it's actually doing a, a good job. So this is a good method. So now here's just a comparison. Um, here's plat scaling on the top. We get these nice, pretty histograms. Here's isotonic regression on the bottom. We get these somewhat less attractive histograms. Turns out if you had 100,000 points uh, instead of 1,000 points in these validation sets, these histograms would look fine too. And the reliability diagrams are essentially the same. I mean, they're not identical, but their quality is very good. One thing cool about isotonic regression is it's actually optimal with respect to squared R. It finds the monotonic transformation that is optimal for squared R on the validation set, um, which is something I guess plot scaling doesn't do. Now let's look at the sample size needed to make these things work well, though. And that's where the difference between these things is going to happen. So this is boosted trees. This is random forests, SVMs, and neural nets. The red line, oh, I'm sorry, and this is now squared R. We're looking at a real measure, not a normalized square here. Okay, So down is good on these plots. The red line, that's the performance you got without any kind of calibration. So that's the raw learning method all by itself. Notice with neural nets, the red line is very good. And this is a log scale for the training set size for the data that's used just to do calibration. OK, so this is uh, 32 data points. Uh, here's 128 out to, say, 8,000 data points used for calibration. If we have a small sample size used for calibration, we actually hurt the probabilities that come out of the neural net. OK, so, so this is actually worse squared error than the neural net trained all by itself on the original sample. Eventually, maybe isotonic regression is able to make a slight improvement slightly fix the prediction. But basically, the neural net was doing really well all by itself. And calibration isn't helping very much. Now let's look at somebody where we know it helps a lot. Here's boosted trees. That's the calibration. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the squared error, the quality of the probabilities, before we did any of this post-calibration. This is what you get with Platt's method. Okay, This is really good performance, especially when you have low sample size. Okay, And then this is the performance you get with isotonic regression. So in the low sample size area, 
you just don't have enough data to do isotonic regression well. It's too powerful of a function. You end up overfitting and hurting things. So you're actually much better off with, with Platt's method. Eventually, you get to the point where there's enough data. In this case, it's somewhere around 2,000 points, where there's sort of a crossing, where they tie. And then beyond that, the extra power of isotonic regression comes into play because you've got enough sample size to do it right, to, to not screw it up. So Platt's method still does extremely well. But now if you've got this much data, I guess you might as well do, do isotonic because it's just as easy to do. And the crossing happens at different places. It could be around 200 cases. Uh, here it's happening around 1,000 cases. Um, and here it's happening around 2,000 cases. But pretty much if you're in the lower sample size regime, which most of our experiments are in low to medium sample sizes, then Platt scaling really seems to be the thing that works better for us. It's only when we have lots of data that we can get that monotonic function right, the full power of the PAV algorithm comes in and can help. And then it can even help things like the neural net a little bit by, by doing something to fix them. So, and here, just you don't see a red line in the SVM. That's because it's so high, it's up off the top of the chart. So, so yeah. Two things here, uh -huh. right? So, so one is the optimization criterion, right? So the, right. the, the version of that John published. I assume he's just too nice to say this himself. Um, I was a little boy. Okay. Uh, the, ver the version that John published tries to optimize the logistics score. It would have been very easy to modify it, so it tried to optimize squared error. Um, so, right. So there's an optimization criterion, mm -hmm. and then there's then there's the power of the function with. with you use hinge loss in your SVM, right? You know, but he's talking about like, uh, when you fit the sigmoid, you can you essentially fit the loss. Oh, yes, 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 of and course. So you, yeah, you're, sorry, saying, sorry. you're saying this might be unfair, unfair to the sigmoid because you're you're measuring a Oh, because I'm measuring on square error. It's optimal in these areas. Right, right. And, and in fact, right. I think when Zadrozny yeah. wrote her paper, yeah. it was, in log loss, they were very close. They couldn't right. distinguish them. Right. And, then, and then there's also, I'm not right. positive this, I suspect there's a version of isotonic regression that would optimize log loss if that's yeah. what you want. Yeah, as far as I can tell, looking at the algorithm, you could make it optimize log loss as well. I, I think so. Although you run into, log loss is funny, you run into problems because of this infinite error that happens at the tails. That, that creates nastinesses that are hard to overcome unless you do a bounded log loss. My impression, my impression yeah. that MSE was, sure. it was very specialized MSE, but that was at least my, my impression that isotonic regression was really hard right. to... But, so maybe I'm wrong about that, but in, uh -huh. any, in any event... No, no, no. So, so, so that's a good point. You're not so, being nice enough to John. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, so I think you're right that what would happen, I think we would still get crossings because it turns out that the sigmoid is not exactly the right correction to apply uh, as far as we can tell by eyeballing the data. And eventually isotonic regression is going to be able to do a more flexible correction. Obviously, but, asymptotically, it has to do at least as well. But it just right. might, cross, right. might cross later is all right, I Right, right. So I, I think that's a great point, that, that the crossing will probably come later if we were, for example, measuring performance here on log loss as opposed to, yeah, that's, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you should have said that. I, would have. <laughs> I wouldn't have been upset. <laughs> But doesn't this debate just come back to the old parametric, non-parametric debate that sort of says, if you assume a parametric form and it's a reasonable assumption, it helps you. But if you assume a form and it's not a reasonable form, it hurts you. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And for the problems we've looked at, it's not that plat scaling ever hurts you. At some point, it's not as good as something else. Well, that's what I'm saying. Right, right. That a non-parametric right. uh, calibration yeah. is better yeah. than a parametric calibration if the parametric form is really inappropriate. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. That, that, that's a good summary of this. Yeah. yeah. And the surprising thing, I guess, is how well you can do with the sigmoid fit for, for these data sets. And, and that, that's exactly what you would want to do if you're data poor. Yeah. There's no theoretical, we've thought about this, there's no theoretical strong justification of why it should be sigmoid just empirically is. <laughs> well, that's like using the normal distribution. Right. At least you have the, the, right. you have the, the, well, yeah. the law of large numbers. Right. Right. I mean, they they have large numbers, numbers, but I don't have large numbers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, think you're, I think you're right. So, so all the discussion is right on target. I mean, it's, yeah. Can you uh, just sure. tell us how uh, when we did the calibration with mm -hmm. John's method or the other one that was where did you get the calibration data? Uh, okay. Some kind of internal cross-validation? So for all of our experiments, we're training on a 4K sample and then doing model selection or validation, or in this case, calibration, using a 1K held aside validation set. 
And then John's method within that 1K will do further cross validation. But um, so say that again. Uh, so so okay, we have 5K that's being used for training. And we're training the models on 4K and then doing either model selection and or calibration using 1K that we've held aside. Is that unfair to neural nets? It seems like they should just use the 5K and be done with it. It turns out with the neural nets, you'd have to do something like early stopping or picking a weight oh, decay parameter. Yeah. But no, th this is actually a very good point because it may be unfair of, to, of all things, bag trees and random forests. It turns out that bag trees and random forests in some experiments that I won't get to talk about it turns out the kind of algorithm you use, the kind of decision tree algorithm you use if you're doing bagging isn't so important. Um, therefore, you really don't necessarily have to hold aside any validation data because any one would work pretty well. And maybe now we should throw the 1K validation, which all the other methods, even boosting, we need the validation data because boosting can and does overfit on some of these problems. And we, I, I should say, when we boost, we do boosting 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, all the way up to 4,000 stages. And we pick whatever stage of boosting yields best performance on the validation set. And on some of these problems, that'll be some small number of boosting steps instead of the full 4,000. So all, almost all of these things, except maybe the bag, trees, and, and the random forests, need a validation set. Um, those things don't need it as much as the others. So they might benefit more by not doing it and throwing it into the train set, in which case it might help them. Yeah. Okay. How old are you setting the parameters, say, of the neural nets? Are you using the 1,000? Right, so we're effectively doing early stopping on the 1,000, finding the learning rate and the momentum that seems to give best performance on the 1,000. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, that's exactly right. So when we're interested in getting good AUC performance, that could be a very different neural net than the one that's best for squared error or best for accuracy. And in fact, they do tend to be very different. And you validate so. for whatever thing you eventually test for. Exactly. Right. Right. So we've always, we've always used the validation set to pick whatever model seemed to be best for the particular metric and problem we're looking at. And then we finally test that model on the big test set. Yeah. OK. So you might think, well, we're done. Right? <laughs> it looks like uh, boosted decision trees just sort of edge out all the other methods after you do calibration and that we'd be there. And it turns out we're not. So here's the same table you've seen. I've added one more line. This is sort of the best of the best of the best if you've seen Men in Black. Um, so what is this? Well, boosted trees, that's the best performance we could get by just boosting all these kinds of decision trees. This is the best for problem one. It's whatever the best model was, no matter what kind it was. For problem two, it's whatever the model was best. Okay, so this is averaging over potentially eight completely different models. Maybe there's one neural net, one SVM, a boosted tree. Who knows what's in there? It's whatever was best for each problem selected using this validation set. This is the dramatic thing. Look at this mean performance, 9533. Three. This is a huge increase in performance over the best model here. And in fact, look at this. This is, this is essentially you know, a five-way tie for first place here compared to that number. This means you can get far better performance if you don't restrict yourself to one model type, like boosted trees, if you train all of these different model types with all their different parameter settings, and just pick, using a small validation set, whatever happens to be best. That's bad news, right? I mean, when I said it was a sad state of affairs, it continues to be a sad state of affairs. And I can now quantify how sad that state of affairs is. <laughs> and it's big, right? It's bigger than the difference between whatever your favorite algorithm was and whatever you thought what an inferior algorithm was, probably. So, so that's really disheartening. Um, it suggests that if you really need the best performance and if you can manage to train many different algorithms on your data set, that it would behoove you to do that <laughs> and then figure out which one works best, right? It's, this is just. This is just horrible. So how often was the best of the best of the best in the top five? So at least we don't have to do uh, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> right, 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 right. So in fact, it is often in the top five. And you get a hint of it, uh, if I can go back fast enough. You get a hint of what the statistics look like from, oh, from the other table. From, oh boy, it's back further than I thought, sorry. From this table. Um, the statistics afterwards look kind of like this, except that a bunch of these neural nets have now been pushed out by, uh, by boosted trees and random forests. Um, so, you, so you will see things like um, here's a bag decision. There's a vanilla decision tree. Just happened to have the best performance. There's a naive Bayes sitting there. Uh, there isn't a logistic regression here, I don't think, but there actually is one in the final table uh, if I had done it. 
Oh, good, 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 because that, that'll stay. So it'll turn out that you know, there is a sort of diminishing returns as you go deeper into the quality of these models. Um, yeah. So we're now doing some experiments where we sort the models by their ultimate performance across everything, and we see how much benefit do we get if we just do the first 50 percent versus all of them. Yeah, yeah. But we haven't gotten there yet. So go ahead. I'm going to leave forward while you talk. How did you choose the best of the best? So we have a validation set, and for every problem, for the metric we're interested in, we go to that validation set and we find which of the 2,000 plus models we've trained has the best performance on that metric on that validation set. And then that's so that means there's a you know overfitting possible here, um, right? I mean we're, we're selecting from many models. Sort of suggest that maybe there is no single right answer for this. Um, for every metric and every method, there'll be a different combination. Yes. Yeah. I, I think um, that's the end. I think that's the right conclusion to draw. Yeah. Have you tried to use an ensemble of uh, all these? Thank you. I'll pay you twenty dollars afterwards. <laughs> 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 can, can you go back one more, just one second? So it looks like there's more. Um, difference for things like accuracy, yeah, or discrepancy, yeah, yeah. Uh, things like cross entropy, which is kind of my preferred one if I'm predicting probabilities. Yeah, no, no, I think you're right. Not as much action or discrepancy. Right now, and, and and you'll also notice there's a, sort of a correlation with how close we are to the top of the scale, how much variation there seems to be. Right, we're a little lower on the scale here, and somehow we do a lot better. And accuracy is a higher variance measure too, so we probably have this broader set of models to select. Yeah, especially yeah. if you, yeah. but you have like. 4,000 training examples typically, yeah. to 2,000 yeah. models to pick which one was best. Right. I, I think that's a, that's a good observation. I think there's lots of more interesting things that we can glean from the numbers if we look at, slice them and dice them in different ways. So, uh, so it seems since you've gathered this immense amount of data, uh -huh. one really interesting thing you might be able to do um, is look at correlations in performance amongst models. Because you might imagine to say, like, OK, well, so, I, I'm having this kind of problem. And yeah. actually, this set of algorithms all kind of right. perform similarly on that kind of problem. We started to do some of it. The problem is that eight or 10 problems isn't so many. So yeah, right. imagine you were interested in which of these are better when it's high dimension versus low dimension. Well, we've only got 10 samples spread across a modest range of dimensionalities. So it would be hard to draw a conclusion. But, but no, 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 I'm, I'm saying something a little different than that. So that, that's kind of saying that given particular problem uh -huh. categories from the best. I'm saying more that just look just across this sampling of tasks, right? right? Look at kind of correlations in performance such that you could say that, okay, uh, if I have a task for which model A does right. well, right. and I can predict that models C, B, and F will also oh, do right, well right. because I've learned that from the structure. Right. So yeah. we're also looking a little bit at that, but we haven't gotten very very far in that. Yeah. And you can imagine what some of these are. You know, if an overfit neural net does well, then probably small k on a k nearest neighbor does well. SVM with a you know larger c, th th things like that. Yeah. No. No. I, I definitely agree. So. Just sure. follow up on Carl's point. I think uh -huh. the biggest gap the point for me is probably coming from the 0.17 gap in calibration, uh -huh. which I wonder to believe precisely right. because this baseline the, problem. It's not a proper score. The, this this does worry us, and we have done the tables with and without calibration in it just because of that. And the truth is, we've gone back and forth a few times on how to define the range for calibration, and we finally found one that just sort of seems copacetic of all the others. It's it's yeah, but but it's kind of a fudged one. So so no, but I, I agree with you. That, that half, half the difference. Yeah. 0.95, 0.9, is caused by calibration. Yeah yeah no, it it is a big one. But but it is. When you look at the data, if, if I were to show you how we did it, it's kind of genuine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. But, but we do worry about this, too. It turns out we're not happy with any of the calibration measures that we use. And you still get statistically significant differences here if you take calibration to the table. Yeah. OK, so the question was, what do we do if we do an ensemble? Let me just jump forward. So here's some ensemble methods. Um, here's the best of the best of the best, which we've already seen. Here's just taking an average of all the models. That it's not very good performance. It's not even as good as boosted trees. And the reason why that's not so good is we have a lot of models that are pretty bad here. So, so we put it in the table just because we sort of had to. We didn't expect it to work well, because some of these models are pretty bad. So averaging across all of them isn't very good. Bayesian averaging, where you uh, weight the models by their performance. So the models that have better performance get a lot more weight than models that have mediocre performance. That actually does ever so slightly better than just selecting the best model. Um, but not as much better as we would have hoped. That, that's surprisingly mediocre Wait, increase in performance. But weighting, but is this a constant weighting for all tasks? Or is this a per task weighting based on task performance? So for every task, uh -huh. 
we calculate effectively the cross entropy, the log loss, and then the weight of the model falls off exponentially with log loss. Okay, so then for it, so yeah. it's a task specific. Yes. Weight. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. That's um, why you get the boost on cross entropy because that's what you're up. Right. Right. Yeah. So stacking, we tried a couple different, we really thought stacking was going to work well. That's training a new model on top of the predictions made by all the other models to figure out how to combine them. We just sort of thought that this would work well. We stacked with logistic regression, and we stacked first with a linear SVM, just thinking that you know, we'd have good capacity control there. And we just haven't gotten it to work. I mean, at some point we decided our code must be broken because it was working so badly. So, so we just have to figure out what's going on here. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. It seems like our code is right, and we've tried it different ways, and it's just terrible performance. The problem seems to be that we've got thousands of models that we're trying to combine, but we only have a validation set of 1,000 points. So overfitting is, is a very nasty problem here, and they're all correlated predictions coming from the models. So overfitting is a huge problem, and we just haven't found a way of controlling the um, complexity of the stacking model in such a way that we actually get good performance out of that we control this. And that's still a surprise to me. Um, that we just, well, I probably shouldn't have this in the table. We're probably not doing stacking as well as we should. Um, OK, so this was kind of a disappointment to us. And we sort of thought, sheesh, we've got to be able to come up with an ensemble method that'll do better than this. So we created a method that we're calling ensemble selection. It's just incredibly simple. Train a bunch of algorithms. Keep all the algorithms. Don't throw any of them away. We've already been doing that. And then we're just going to do greedy, forward, stepwise selection of the available models, putting them into an ensemble. OK, so this is just incredibly simple. So let's say we want to optimize AUC. One cool thing about this measure is you can optimize to any, uh, uh, about this algorithm is you can optimize to any performance measure. So that, that's kind of nice. So here's the AUC of all these different models. Think of this as being thousands of models that we've trained. Here's all of their AUCs. One of these has the best AUC. Greedily put it into the ensemble. OK, so it's just now in the ensemble. Um, now what do we do is we calculate the AUC of model 1 if it were added to model 3 in the ensemble. And that AUC is 8327. In fact, actually worse than the AUC of model 1 all by itself. So that's kind of interesting. So that's not a good thing to put in there, probably. So we calculate the performance that we would get if we added each of these things, one at a time, to that ensemble. And it turns out that adding model 9 to the ensemble gives us the best AUC. So now greedily, we put it in the ensemble. And we just play the game again. It turns out now adding model 6 to the ensemble. And notice, this is the best of the best of the best. That's the, the first model put in the ensemble is always the one that was best on that measure. So that's the best of the best of the best performance that's in the table. And then this is the performance we get by adding another model to it and yet another model. And I think you can see we're, we're climbing uphill. Again, we're using the same validation set that we're using for everything else to, to do this. So it's just standard forward feature selection. But now instead of feature selection, it's model selection. Okay. I'll uh, say it again. Is it Bayesian no, no. Although, although it's been suggested we should try Bayesian weighting. This is just even weighting of, of the models. Yeah. Well, I'll talk a little bit about that. The big problem here is overfitting. And if you don't control overfitting, this method will actually give you worse performance than best of the best of the best. It'll, it'll actually go downhill. But it turns out it's not so hard to control its overfitting. And here's some tricks we've been using. We haven't decided what subset of these tricks is best. But you have to do some tricks or else it'll hurt. Um, we just get rid of a bunch of the really bad models. You know, get rid of the 500 worst models. Get rid of them. It turns out that helps, because then you just can't make so many gross <laughs> mistakes. Um, we initialize the ensemble with, say, 5 or 10 or 15 of the best models, as opposed to initializing the ensemble with no models. Turns out, on some problems, you tend to overfit right at the very beginning. You're much more likely to overfit in the beginning than later. And that's because that's where you have least mass. So adding a new model can have the most impact on what you're doing. And that's where overfitting's most likely to happen. So in fact, what we do is we just initialize the thing with like the 10 best models. And it turns out that just is a strong place to start. You know, the 10 best models can't be bad. So, so that, that's not a bad way to initialize. Here's an important one. We do selection with replacement. So a model can actually get added a second and a third time, unlike what I showed you on the previous slides. It can now be added a second and third time. This is important for two reasons. One. If a model is added, say, three times, it gets three times as much weight in the average as a model added once. So it's a crude way of doing very simple integer weights on models. The other reason, though, which is actually more important, is it turns out some problems, there are some good things. You add them, you add them, add them. And then you're suddenly forced to start adding things that are bad, and you go downhill pretty quickly. And now it means that figuring out where to stop adding things to the ensemble is really important. You know, it's like a neural net that sort of trains up quickly and then down quickly. You've got to early stop exactly the right place or you miss the peak. Um, if we do sampling with replacement, what the thing tends to do is it tends to climb uphill, 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 a little higher 
uphill than before because of weighting. And then, as you would have in the past, forced it to add inferior models. Now it says, oh, well, none of the other models look any good. It just keeps adding the good ones it's already added. And it kind of just stays there. So and it means that it's no longer critical where we stop. OK, so it means we can get away with really crude stopping criteria, which is nice because the last thing we want is to have to have another validation set to do stop. We don't want to have to use any more validation data than you would have had to use to early stop a neural net or pick an SVM kernel. Um, the other thing we do is, it turns out, we calibrate all the models so that they are all speaking the same probability language. And this sort of helps them when you average them. They're, they're sort of speaking the same language, so averaging them makes sense. And then we bag this whole process just because it's a high variance process. And uh, that just sort of reduces that. Here's ensemble selection added to the table. Notice that ensemble selection is a fair step above these other things. Okay, so it's not as big as this step from here to here. Although, as John's pointed out, most of that step, oh, almost half of that step comes from this calibration measure. Um, it's quite a big step, though, and it's not coming from calibration. So it actually is coming from performance. And part of the reason why we're getting that good performance is we're actually able to optimize the ensemble to each of these metrics individually. It's a different ensemble for accuracy than it is for AUC. And if you look at the models it pulls in, it even kind of makes sense. Like it tends to like neural nets for squared R, and it tends to like SVMs and boosted things for accuracy. And it, it kind of does a flavor of what you might have guessed. So, so that's kind of cool. So this is really working kind of well. Um, here's, this is uh, Claire Cardi and Art Munson. Um, I was really just a consultant on this paper. They did all the work. This is three natural language problems. They were really, in natural language processing, they often optimized to very different criteria than we do. Um, so they were really excited by the fact that they could optimize to whatever the right criterion was for their problem. And let me just show you what this is. So there's three different problems, red, blue, and turquoise. And then these are the measures, accuracy, average precision, the measures we used, and then their measures that are more important to them, GACC, I don't even know what this is, B3, F1, uh, F0, you know, these different measures. Basically, zero means that you're doing the same as the best of the best of the best. They're training, by the way, very different models than we are. They have their own set of models that they think are appropriate. There are some SVMs in there and bagged models, but they're training different models. There's some rules in here, like Ripper. Um, zero would mean best of the best of the best. Anything above zero is like the percent improvement above best of the best of the best. And below zero means we're actually doing worse than best of the best of the best. And I think you can see, especially on the, the red and the blue problem, we are providing a significant increase in performance. On the turquoise problem, it, it turns out it's a wash. We sort of help as much as we hurt. So, so it's not a big deal there. On average, across the three problems, it's about a 15% improvement, which is, which is sizable in their community. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to show you that this technique can work in the hands of somebody else who's working on a completely different class of problem, much larger training and validation sets here, it turns out, and for very different measures. And they did some really cool things here. They actually wrapped the ensemble selection around this whole clustering process, and just, just really cool things. So all right, I'm, I'm going to wrap up real fast here. Um, all of the expense goes into training those thousands of models. That takes days or a week or whatever. The ensemble selection, this selecting the models that are good for a criterion, that takes seconds or minutes. OK, so that's, that's easy. It turns out you can run this on your laptop. This is the hard part, generating all the models in the first place. But there's a problem. The good news is, hey, this really seems to work. OK, whenever we try it, we get sort of the best performance we know how to attain by using this, this method. Um, so it wins more than 90% of the time. The bad news is these ensembles are just nastily big and gross and ugly. Here's one of them I just opened up. <laughs> OK, let me, let me show you what's in this ensemble. Remember I said we bagged the process. Oh, God. There's 72 boosted trees. Now, boosted trees, each of those is maybe thousands of stages of boosting, right? So there are 28,000 decision trees. Here's another 1,000 coming from random forest. Here's <laughs> 5 times 100 coming from bagging. 44 different neural nets, right? That's 22. I counted the hidden units. It's 2,200 hidden units. Um, we have 115 different memory-based learning models. I don't know how to count that. They're all in the same training set. So they're just different loops around the same training set. There's 38 SVMs, each of which has its own support vectors. There's boosted stumps. 36,000 stumps are in there. Now, of course, we don't have that many attributes in any of these problems, so there's a lot of redundancy in the stumps. This is really gross. It's, it takes a gigabyte to store this thing. Uh, <laughs> okay. And it, How much does it take to store the training data? Uh, the training data, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's like kilobytes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, mean, I mean, with, with effort, you could memorize the training data yourself. <laughs> so, so, so this is really kind of gross. And it takes seconds to execute all of those models 
on, on a test point, right? So, so nobody in their right mind is ever going to use this. It's never going to fit in your PD. That's not true. I mean, <laughs> so one gig is not, for this problem is a lot, but all those things can be executed in parallel. And the, uh, oh, I don't no, get right. a decision from a boosted tree. I right. mean, that's nothing. No, no. Right? So you can right. run all the boosted trees on one single machine right. and if parallelize you, with. If you gave me, let's see, 28,000. <laughs> if you gave me 50,000 machines, you know, I could get an answer for you really, really fast. No, I, I mean, you're, you're right. But, but the decision trees doesn't, don't have to be right. per machine, right? Uh, I mean, right. those are, you go no, three no. nodes and you're yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a related point, right? So for 38 SKFs, right, you've got hundreds of support factors in total. Right. But presumably those are typically the same support factors. Oh, yeah. Th there's certainly and, overlap and between them. And if you, are, if you yeah. wrote the code yeah. to, do the, right. to do the sharing well, properly, well, and, and that's even similarly for the boosted stump models. It, it's even more true for the boosted stump models, right? Exactly. Because there's, right. And you've got the yeah. KDR's yeah. neighbor models. Yeah. Where, yeah. Uh, no. but, but, no. but the KDR's neighbor models, right, that presumably you could you could get some efficiency out of it. Well, you should be able to get 100. It's all the same training set. Right. It's all the same training set. So exactly. Like computing your neighbors, you're always computing yeah. it the same. Right. No, no, no. You, you can definitely get this. You can make this more efficient. <laughs> um, but it's still going to be a problem if you want millisecond response times and you want to apply this to you know 100 million cases or something like that, right? It, or if you want to fit it on your PDA, you know that's probably just not going to happen. Uh, okay, so. So are your cell phones. So, so those are going to be problems. So we're worried about this because, you know, who's really going to use this thing? I mean, yeah, we get great performance with it, and it's a little better than you can do any other way we know of. But what do we do? So we've been doing, this is now early work that we're doing. We're trying to do model compression, where we train another model to mimic this nasty ensemble. So and the way we do that is we create a huge synthetic data set. We pass it through the ensemble, collect the ensemble's probabilistic predictions, and then we're going to train another model to try to mimic the ensemble. And we're limited here, you know, we can only pass a synthetic set a certain size through the thing because you can see it's expensive to run it. So the hope is that we can get away with, you know, hundreds of thousands at most and not millions of points. And right now we're using a neural net, and it turns out a neural net is performing reasonably well. So this is early days. We've just started doing this, and we're actually surprised it's working so well. So let me just show you what this is, and then I'll, I'll take your question. Um, so this is the number of hidden units in the network. So this is 1, 2, 4, you know, 16. This is a 32, 64, and 128 out here. And this is squared error, so down is good. And this is the best squared error we could get by training any of our neural nets on the original data set. So we could achieve that squared error. By doing ensemble selection, we got a big improvement in squared error. We knocked the squared error on the same test set all the way down to here on, on the ensemble. And that ensemble probably includes some of these neural nets in it. Well, now we're training neural nets of different sizes using the synthetic data to mimic the function learned by the ensemble. And it turns out we're already able to get a neural net with just a modest number of hidden units, 32, 64 hidden units, to almost perform as well as the ensemble, at least on squared error. And then if the ensemble was optimized to AUC, if we can get the squared error of the neural net close enough to the performance of the ensemble, it should also be good on AUC. So that, that's the kind of game we're hoping for. We're actually hoping this line will get, get to be there or cross it. But we're doing pretty well so far, better than we expected. And we're using neural nets. I mean, 128 hidden units is nothing, right? It, you know, it's a couple thousand weights. It's two matrix multiplies. I mean, this is computationally fast. It's, it's compact. It would fit on your PDA. Um, so that's kind of nice. We briefly tried uh, decision trees. The problem with decision trees is they just grew to enormous complexity before they could mimic what the ensemble had learned. Um, and SVMs you would think would be good, except the number of support vectors you need to represent the, the ensemble grows large fast. So, so far, neural nets seem to be you know, a good thing. So, so just because they're sort of able to do it, and they're able to do it without billions of, of hidden units. Um, now let's see, question. Oh, I was wondering, um, have you looked at, I mean, so you showed the one with 422 models. Um, have you guys done experiments where you look at number of models versus fall off in that performance? So maybe it's like, what if you just had 10 to the top 10? Top right, 10 right, right. So, so we are looking at some of that stuff now. And in fact, the thing that looks most hopeful right now is it turns out if we sort the models by their total performance and then eliminate, say, 50% of them before we even build the ensemble, 
This not only means that there are fewer models possible in the ensemble because half of them weren't even available, it turns out it improves the performance of the ensemble a little too. So we're hoping that it's this magic win-win situation where we can actually reduce the complexity of the ensemble in the first place and even get better performance out of it. Yeah, but it's early days for all of this stuff where we're trying to look at how the models correlate with each other, which ones we can safely eliminate, which ones are necessary for the best performance. If you could only train a percentage of them, what order should you train them in? All that, it's early days for all of that, that stuff, yeah, yeah. So, so I think those are all the, exactly the right intuitions, and we just haven't gotten there yet, yeah. yeah. And if you want to help us get there, we'd be happy to, happy to work with you, so. So the fact that using synthetic data now helps you that much yeah. it also suggests that this has a good chance of working with semi-supervised learning. Oh, and yeah, we know that, yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. back trees will work very well, right, with right, semi-supervised right. learning. Right, I think that's a great suggestion. Have you tried something like that? No, 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 we haven't. And you, you know, we're creating synthetic data. We, we have a trick. You can't just generate random data or else you don't sample from the right manifold well. And, you know, you need billions of points then. So we have a trick for generating synthetic data that I won't go into because I don't know that it's a particularly good trick. Um, we'd love to be in a domain where there just was tons of unlabeled data around because then we would just use the unlabeled data as a beautiful uh, sampling from the right distribution of, of the points. But we're doing this because in many domains you wouldn't have this large amount of unlabeled data. So this is, we're, we're tackling the harder case where, where you wouldn't have extra unlabeled data. I think semi-supervised learning would, would be a great idea here. So if you'd like to try that, um, we'd be happy to we'd be happy to pass you some data and some models. It turns out it's it's not so hard to pass data around and predictions. Passing the models around is much messier, but we could we could pass data and predictions around, and then you can do all the semi semi supervised learning from that. Yeah, if, if you're interested in that, we'd be happy to. We don't have that much test data, and in a lot of problems, I mean, we're doing a funny thing, right? We might have 50,000 points, and we're only training on 5,000, and then we're right. holding aside 45,000 for test right. or something like that. And it, that's but still not enough. Well, you, you wouldn't do this in a real problem anyway, right? If you had 50,000 points, God, you'd use as much of the 50,000 as you could for training, and then you wouldn't have any left over to do this, unless you had truly unlabeled data natural in your domain, in which case you'd have a a large sample of, of the right kind of points. So again, going back to the beginning, you were talking about the gap between the best and the best, the best in the ensemble will shrink as, as, as your actual label training set goes up. I wonder. Yeah, I, I assume everything is going to asymptote at very good performance once we get to... Like everything will squeeze. A, a, absolutely. I, I think, and in fact, we had thought, when we saw the Bayesian averaging uh, and the stacking, doing so comparably to best of the best of the best, we had thought maybe we were already at the ceiling. But we had thought that on these problems maybe we were pushing the ceiling on them, in which case going to more data wouldn't have necessarily even helped. Um, and that, we were just kind of surprised to see that that's not the case. There actually is room for improvement in these things. And we assume if we continue to refine the method, we'll actually find even more room for improvement. OK, um, I'm going to skip through this just for the sake of time. If anybody's interested in these pretty pictures, I'll tell you about it later. Here's just one that I should mention because a number of people brought it up. All right, you know, we've trained 100,000 models on all these different problems and evaluated performance on all these different measures. It just made sense to ask the question, how do the performance measures relate to each other? Um, and what we did was, if you're familiar with multidimensional scaling, it's basically a way of finding a high fidelity, low dimensional representation of data. So we've done a multidimensional scaling of these metrics. Uh, ignore SAR, it's the average of RMS accuracy and AUC. So that's why it's sort of falling in between the, those things. We were wondering what that would be, because that was our favorite metric from each of the three categories. Um, so here's a 2D plot. It turns out the metrics really fit in more like a three to five dimensional space. So they actually are measuring different things. But here's a 2D plot of these measures. And notice the... Uh, Ordering metrics are very close to each other. Average precision, AUC, and the break-even point. This forms a, a nice tight, tight grouping there. Um, squared error and cross entropy, as you might have thought, are, are close to each other, with squared error being a little closer to the center of the space than, than cross entropy. Um, this calibration measure is a true oddball, and it sits off far in the space. But it's not a, a meaningful place to be. Notice that it's actually closest to the other probability measures, so as you might have hoped. Um, and then accuracy, F-score, and lift, those are the three things we were calling the threshold metrics. They don't really cluster that well. I mean, I put them together in one. It, it, took, a, 
it took an hour to find a label to put on that set of three measures <laughs> so that our tables would be three sets of three. Um, they don't really cluster together that well. And in fact, if you look at the third dimension, they're forming a sort of halo in the third dimension that they spread around this ring that goes from good calibration to good ordering. So, so it's kind of interesting. There's a real axis from calibration to ordering, and then these things sort of fit around it. And squared error, it turns out, uh, I'm not going to show you the results of this stuff, but if you had to pick one measure to optimize to, and then try to get excellent performance on all the other measures out of it, it turns out squared error is probably the safest, with cross entropy being a close second. So, so these are the, the good ones. Trying to optimize to AUC, you sometimes overfit if you try to optimize to AUC. An interesting thing, though, is if you train a bunch of models on squared R, so you've trained a whole bunch of you know, thousands of models to optimize squared R, then if you want to pick models that have good performance on lots of other metrics, then you should do model selection using AUC. Don't try to fit to AUC, but use it for a model selection criterion, and then it works very, very well. All right, and I just, I've gone way, way over. So I don't know, do you want a summary? Hey, neural nest bag trees, random forest, predict great probabilities without doing any extra work. If you're willing to do plat scaling or isotonic regression, you can get even better probabilities with boosted trees uh, or if you calibrate the random forest or, or SVMs. Um, where the sigmoid is appropriate, plat scaling is, is just the right thing to do. And in particular, for the maximum margin methods, the sigmoid seems to be pretty much appropriate. And this works best with, when you have little data. If you have lots of data, then the isotonic regression comes into its own and can find a more, a more uh, flexible fitting function. Empirically calibrated trees, it's like you know, return of the decision tree, an algorithm we would have thought 15 years ago was maybe you know, time to be retired. You know, things like bagging and boosting in random forests have really brought the decision tree back as being an incredibly nice thing to use. It doesn't mean that boosting neural nets or, or bagging neural nets wouldn't be a good thing, but it's still kind of hard to do that. So this is just really nice. And neural nets can't handle missing values and things the way boosted trees do so well. The important message, I think, is, you know, so far, no one learning method is really doing all of it. We get much better performance by training all of these things and picking what's best for each problem and metric than by sticking with any one uh, algorithm class. Um, so that's really nice. And then the cool thing is if you're going to go to the work of generating all those different models so that you can pick the best, well, there is something you can do that will actually be better. And there's this ensemble selection technique. And we, we've got to think that stacking or Bayesian model averaging can be made to w perform as well, too. So we're, we're actually doing some more work to try to, uh, they should just work as well, right? I mean, forward greedy selection just can't be the right answer. Um, but the cool thing about gr forward greedy selection is that can optimize to any metric. You can do selection for any performance metric you can calculate quickly, which is kind of nice. And then let me just skip that. Thank you very much for staying. Wow. <laughs> I've never talked this long, so. <laughs> so. One last question. I, 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 sure. I just want the conditional random field. Uh, it's not included no, here. No, 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 no. So, in fact, the two Bayesian methods that we'd really like to have in here are, you know, graphical models trained generatively and discriminatively. And the reason why they're not in there is we didn't feel we had enough expertise to run them properly. So the last thing we want to do is put an algorithm in there that we can't run fairly and have it have mediocre performance because we're incompetent. So, so, so and that's why Gaussian processes aren't in there. I don't, I don't feel like we have enough expertise in the group yet to really give them a fair shake. So, yeah. But if you would like to run one of your favorite algorithms on our problems, we'd be happy to give you our trained test set folds. And then you can just pass us back predictions, and we can even do the calibration after the fact. You don't even have to do the calibration. We, we'd be happy to do that. So, yeah. yeah. Are you for just a few more? I, I think I am. I, I, My name is Jeff. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I am not in.